In 2017, 32-year-old Olivia Lone Bear, an indigenous mother of five from North Dakota, went missing. Her family searched for her for months and pushed law enforcement to take the case more seriously. Nine months later, a volunteer community member found her body in a pickup truck, submerged in a lake within a mile of her home. This is just one case out of thousands of Native American women who go missing and are later found dead. In the United States, indigenous women and girls are disappearing and being murdered at alarming rates compared to other women in what's often called an epidemic of violence. Joining us to discuss this are Mary Catherine Nagel, a citizen of Cherokee Nation and lawyer focused on tribal sovereignty and safety for Native women and children. Kerry Colfer, member of the Clinkett Tribe of Southeast Alaska and National Indigenous Women's Resource Center's Senior Native Affairs Advisor. Thank you both for joining me on Upfront. Mary Catherine, in recent years, thousands of Native American women have been reported missing. Law enforcement is often slow to react, and families are often left waiting months for answers, and they're often dismissed and told that going missing isn't a crime. What's at the root of this crisis? You know, such an important question, and I think we have to understand that this crisis is both cultural and legal in nature. I say cultural because violence against Native women is a practice that began with the colonial conquest of the United States. I mean, all you have to do is read Christopher Columbus's journals to understand that this is a man who literally bragged about raping and murdering indigenous women when he got lost and washed up on the shoreline over here. So you've got that. You've got the history of the U.S. military using rape and homicide against Native women as a military tactic to conquer tribal nations. We don't talk about that history. It's not a mystery as to why there's a high rate of violence against our Native women today. At the same time, we have a legal framework that allows that violence to continue. In 1978, the United States Supreme Court in Oliphant versus Suquamish Indian Tribe eliminated tribal criminal jurisdiction over non-Indians who come onto tribal lands and commit crimes. So today, non-Indians can walk onto a reservation or onto Indian lands and murder a Native woman with no consequences, and they do. The Supreme Court has taken that jurisdiction away. Well, and, and I want to unpack the legal part of that in, in just a sec. I, I'm still trying to wrap my mind around, though, this idea that when a crime is committed or when someone is just reported missing, uh, Carrie, that the response is indifference or, you know, it's not a crime to go missing. They get dismissed. I mean, why is that? I think, in part, Native women are really underrepresented in data. Um, and so we know that the statistics of missing or murdered Indigenous women are extremely high, but we know that that's, ac that's actually, they're actually likely a lot higher. And so all of these historical factors, in addition to these jurisdictional ba um, barriers, and the failure of federal, the federal government to adequately fund justice and victim service systems in Indian country has led to predators knowing that they can target Native women without repercussions, and no one's really going to care because the mainstream media doesn't really cover it very well often. Oh, Mary Catherine, I mean, you're one of the people who said that we have a culture that promotes and celebrates violence against Native women. Um, the data seems to bear that out. Native American women are two and a half more likely to be raped compared to all other races. And in some reservations, murder rates of Native American women are up to 10 times uh, higher than the national average for all races. Can you speak to this dynamic? Yeah, in terms of culture, up until this last summer, Native women's bodies were still used to sell butter and other commercial products. Uh, that is starting to change. You know, Land O'Lakes just changed their label. But um, many Americans still think that it's completely appropriate to dress up as Pocahontas for Halloween. Pocahontas was a child victim of rape, kidnapping, and homicide. She was an indigenous girl, a little girl, who lost her life to violence, to sexual violence. And she's not a Halloween costume. But so long as our real women who are murdered and raped are just treated as Halloween costumes, it creates a culture that just honestly accepts this violence so that when a Native woman is raped or goes missing or is murdered, I think because we have been uh, dehumanized and over-sexualized, it's, it's harder for Americans at large to, to have that kind of emotional response of, we need to find her, her life matters, when, when a Native woman goes missing. Carrie, this pop culture piece is interesting to me. It, how much of it is the kind of indifference to the lives and the well-being of Native women, and how much of it is an ignorance of history? I think it's a combination of all of it. I think it's a lack of understanding about um, our history. I think most of the time in history class, uh, Natives make up like the first chapter, um, despite the fact that we've been here for all of American history and, and centuries, thousands of years prior to that. And then I think there is 
also willful ignorance. Um, I think it feels these issues often feel very far away to other native uh, to other non-native people who don't live on or near tribal lands, and so they can sort of ignore all of these issues that native women face, and they never really have to deal with it or think about it. And frankly, they don't want to. Carrie, let, let me ask you another question because we started to talk about this idea of non-native perpetrators of violence. Uh, Ninety-six percent of the time, violence against indigenous women is from a non-native perpetrator. Uh, tribal courts, uh, tribal police, for the most part, don't have the ability to prosecute crimes on reservations from non-native perpetrators or even arrest them without backup from non-native law enforcement. Uh, it's hard for many people, myself included, to understand how this is legal. Yeah, I, I think it's, it's hard for uh, natives to, to figure out how it's legal as well. Um, uh, as Mary Catherine said, um, after the Supreme Court's decision, in Oliphant in 1978, um, tribal justice systems could no longer hold accountable criminally abusive non-natives who were continuing to harm their native partners, resulting in situations where non-native defendants piled up repeated in multiple prior contacts with tribal police. So essentially, tribal police and courts weren't able to do very much to stop non-native perpetrators. And then federal and state courts also just failed to protect native victims. Um, and that's where we are today and, and the issues we're facing today and, and how all of this mess has been created. Mary Catherine, that, that's, that's part of the, the, the crisis here, right? I mean, on the one hand, you don't have jurisdiction in this area, but then you have the state and the federal police and, and, and bodies that can intervene, but don't. Absolutely. In most cases on tribal lands, if a Native woman is murdered, uh, the federal government does have jurisdiction. So we're looking at the federal government and saying, why aren't you doing your job? You right. know, you took the jurisdiction away from us, so do something. Step in. You know, we have we have Native women, like Olivia Lone Bear is a great example, because her brother for nine months, begged the FBI to search for his sister. Begged. I mean, you know, he wasn't. He was on national TV. He was sending letters. He was making phone calls, and they did nothing. And they had jurisdiction. Mary Catherine, you've said uh, placing paternalistic restrictions on tribal courts in the name of due process is nothing more than a disguise for prejudice. What do you mean by that? Sure, because I think. You know, you're right. A lot of folks will throw out this idea of, well, non-Indian defendants, their due process rights are not protected in tribal court. The problem with this straw man argument is that the folks who say that actually can't point to a single piece of evidence, shred of evidence, where non-Indians' rights have been violated. Hmm. And that's the irony of these arguments. I'm not saying tribal courts are perfect. If you look at state and federal courts, they're not perfect. And that's why I think it's based in, on prejudice, because, hmm. you know, I... <laughs> <laughs> For instance, in Oliphant, when the Supreme Court in 1978 took away tribal criminal jurisdiction over non-Indians, one of the things that Chief uh, Rehnquist at the time said is, you know, we just there's just no way to think that a, a non-Indian is going to get a fair shake in tribal court. Well, wait a second. J because that non-Indian is not a citizen of that tribe, that non-Indian can't vote in that tribe's elections. Well, I'm not a citizen of the state of Kansas, but if I walk into Kansas and start murdering people, I don't get to have a constitutional right to avoid a criminal prosecution because of due process. I'm sorry, that's not how it works. And because works. you can't vote for K exactly, Kansas' governor. Exactly, because I don't get to vote for <laughs> Kansas' governor or pick who's on their Supreme Court. And one thing really quick about due process, there are due process protections in the Violence Against Women Act you know, right to counsel, right to notice, right to file a habeas in federal court, basically all the protections you would have in state court or federal court. And still, the conversation, there are still people out there saying, well, we just don't think that due process rights are protected in tribal court, even though it's, it's in the law and no one can point to a shred of evidence that it hasn't been provided. And so I really do yeah. think we're talking about prejudice. Let's stay on this topic of the Violence Against Women Act. Uh, the renewal passed in the House of Representatives in 2019, uh, Carrie, but it's languishing in the Senate. If passed, it would expand tribal jurisdiction to include other offenses like sexual assault, stalking, trafficking, and child abuse. Uh, what kind of difference would that make, again, on the ground, on a day-to-day -day level? Yeah, I mean, it would make a huge difference. What we've heard from tribal leaders, judges, um, advocates since 2013, since certain tribes started exercising special jurisdiction under VAWA 2013, is that although it's been really successful in protecting tribal communities um, from perpetrators who commit dating violence or domestic violence, the narrowness of jurisdiction under VAWA 2013 is a continual source of frustration. And that's because it creates those loopholes for offenders, it leaves victims unprotected, 
and it limits how effectively tribes can prosecute domestic violence offenders for crimes that co-occur with domestic violence. So enhancing, you know, these provisions and expanding um, tribal jurisdiction will help to better protect tribal communities, surrounding communities, and ultimately, hopefully, we would see a decline in the rates of abuse of Native women. We know that there is a long history of institutional racism against indigenous people in this country. Uh, the question that I want to get for, an answer from for you two uh, is sort of how we go about reversing that history. As a practical matter, what can we do, and how do you specifically go about doing that work? Uh, I'll start with you, Mary Catherine. It's a huge question, you know, and I think that there's invisibility, right? Uh, most people, if they know of a Native woman, they know of, of a Halloween costume, and that's it. We're starting to change that. You know, we've got our first Native woman uh, member of the cabinet, the Secretary of Interior, Deb Holland, right? We've got Native women in Congress. We have a lot of work to do in the curriculum in the United States. You know, uh, most law schools don't teach Oliphant, right? So most law students who go to law schools don't study the Supreme Court decision that is the reason why our Native women face the highest rates of domestic violence, sexual assault, and homicide in the United States. Mary Catherine's talked a lot about the kind of educational piece and a bit of the cultural piece. Carrie, what else can be done to undo this violence, this legacy of violence against indigenous people? Well, first, we need to adequately fund and provide resources to tribes. Tribes are consistently set up to fail um, by this chronic underfunding. So we need to ensure that tribes not only have the authority, which is what we talked about a little bit with VAWA, but also the resources to hold offenders accountable, to provide culturally centered services to their community, to improve data collection so we really know the extent of the problem and can help identify more victims across jurisdictional lines. And so the sooner we give Native people, and that's especially Native victims and families of victims a seat at the table in decision making and ensure that they're part of these larger conversations, the sooner we can come up with solutions that are actually tailored specifically to the needs of Native nations. Carrie, Mary Catherine, thank you both so much for joining me in this conversation. Really appreciate it. Everybody, that is our show. Upfront, we'll be back next week.